Hello, everyone, and welcome to Lab Manager's Tech Trends webinar series. My name is Trevor Henderson, Technology Editor for Lab Manager, and I will be moderating today's discussion, which will focus on laboratory gas generators. Today we are joined by John Sparenza, a leading industry specialist who will outline some of the recent developments in gas generator technology. We like our webinars to be very interactive, so we encourage you to send us your questions at any point during the webinar, and these will be addressed during the question and answer session that will follow the presentation. To ask questions, simply type your query into the question box at the bottom left-hand side of your screen. We will try to address as many questions as possible during the Q&A session, and if we happen to run out of time, I will forward any unanswered questions to our presenter, and he can respond to you directly. Additional resources can be accessed through the resource widget located at the bottom of your screen. You may also move or resize any of the windows simply by grabbing them at the top or stretching them at the bottom right corner. This webinar recording will be available early next week on Lab Manager's website. At the end of the webinar, we will share that link with you. With that, let me introduce today's speaker. John Sparenza is Vice President of Commercial Product Sales at Proton Onsite. Mr. Sparenza joined Proton Onsite in 1997 and was involved in the development of Proton's core technology and industrial product line. Prior to joining Proton, Mr. Sparenza spent 12 years at Hamilton Sunstrand Division of United Technologies Corporation developing PEM fuel cell and electrolyzer products for military and aerospace applications. Mr. Sparenza has been granted 18 patents to date in the areas of control systems, fuel cell and electrolyzer systems, and power plant efficiency and improvements. Mr. Sparenza has published numerous papers, case studies, and articles on the advantage of on-site gas generation for use in the analytical laboratory, and has a degree in, in electrical engineering technology from the University of Hartford. Thank you for joining us today, John. Thank you, Trevor, and uh, uh, thank you um, all for, for joining me in this discussion about uh, handling gas uh, in your laboratories. Uh, we're going to focus this discussion on a comparison um, of benefits and, uh, and highlight some disadvantages of, of uh, cylinders versus uh, gas generators. Um, let me start by first highlighting the, uh, the areas where uh, you, will, um, you will benefit from uh, in, during this discussion. Uh, you're going to take away today uh, 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 a greater knowledge of the various advantages and disadvantages of cylinders as well as gas generator systems. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, some recent developments in gas generation technology that uh, has affected uh, the ability of, of this technology to it enhance uh, the operation of your laboratories. Uh, we're going to spend some time talking about the helium crisis and uh, switching from helium to hydrogen as a carrier gas. And uh, lastly, and I think throughout the presentation, you'll get a sense of how to implement a switch from traditional cylinder uh, supply of gas to a gas generator. We're going to start up our discussion talking about um, helium and hydrogen gases. And with that, uh, I want to first talk about uh, the two gases specifically. Um, uh, no surprise, uh, hydrogen. Um, is a gas that is flammable, um, needs to be handled um, uh, in a certain way, uh, and has certain uh, standards that define where it can be located and stored. Helium, an inert gas, um, I think remains you know, the, the choice, uh, the main choice of supply for carrier gas applications specifically in the United States, because it is an inert gas and is not flammable. Um, the traditional modes of supply for those gases are varied, but uh, they usually are supplied in single cylinder form or cylinder pack form, be it a 6-pack, 12-pack, uh, I've even seen 36-pack cylinder pallets that are used. 
as well as uh, high pressure tube bundles, either stationary or delivered as tube trailers that are swapped in and out of a facility. Again, all very dependent on um, the type of gas and your usage rates. So as we dig a little bit deeper into, into the traditional modes of supply and talk about uh, cylinders and packs and, and tube trailers, um, those traditional modes of supply, again, vary uh, depending on usage rates uh, primarily and also the distance from the central production or distribution facilities for those gases. So as you can, uh, as you can imagine, the more gas you use, the higher volume of those gases you're going to be storing on site, as well as um, the further you are away from a distribution point or a production point for that gas, it's going to be much more economical for you to store more gas on site than have frequent deliveries. So those are really the key uh, points to, to keep in mind, and those really are um, the, the key points to keep in mind from a, from a cost perspective. Those are the two main factors that affect uh, the cost of your gases and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but in general, the delivery of gas, albeit in cylinder form or tube trailer form, um, has been delivered for decades by a well-organized and well-regulated industrial gas infrastructure here in the United States. Uh, they've done it, done it well they've done it uh, as efficient as they can, and they have a relatively good safety record uh, supplying those gases to laboratories. Um, one thing that, that they don't necessarily have control over, though, is the cost of those gases. And whether it is helium and the cost is associated with a, um, a global helium shortage, or whether it's hydrogen and it's associated with handling a hazardous gas or delivering it over long distances and repackaging it from its primary uh, form, which is liquid, to gaseous hydrogen, those costs are variable. And the reason why they're most variable is because they're related to transportation and infrastructure that is uh, tied to uh, fuel costs. Just, just think about the helium and hydrogen elements and, and what makes them unique. They're the lightest elements uh, that we have. And we're transporting them over very long distances using very heavy methods. <laughs> and repackaging them several times before it gets to the end user. So um, uh, you're delivering the lightest element in the universe um, in very heavy cylinders, tube trailers, and trucks. So very dependent on the price of fuel. And as you can appreciate, those fuel costs are not very stable and and increasing, so fuel prices or gas prices will um, will certainly not be uh, remain stable going forward. Um, just to give you a little idea, a, a, a snapshot of where these gases are born, let's say um, most of the hydrogen, well, I'll say all of the hydrogen is located. Um, in the areas identified on this map in the United States, uh, the major supply of hydrogen in liquid form comes from New Orleans. Another major supply comes from Niagara Falls, where it's actually electrolytically produced. 
And uh, for the West, you're either getting it from New Orleans or you're getting it from Ontario, California. Uh, those three major areas of production and main points of initial distribution are pushing uh, probably 80% of the liquid hydrogen into the market from those three points. Um, helium, um, helium comes from uh, the, the majority of helium, over 50% of the U.S. consumption of helium comes from one major source in Texas, which is the U.S. Um, reserve, uh, helium reserve. And uh, like I said, that supplies over half of the consumption of the United States helium. So as we uh, focus a little bit more of our discussion on helium and the fact that, that uh, helium reserve in Texas supplies over 50% of the U.S. supply and actually uh, is exported uh, to supply a lot of the, the world's uh, hydrogen uh, needs, um, it is easy to understand that because helium is an element that is mined and is of, of limited supply, there are no new sources of helium. Um, it is not produced it is naturally, it's a naturally occurring element that needs to be collected from other sources. It's primarily mined from either caverns that hold uh, large natural gas pockets where it's actually mixed in with natural gas and stripped out uh, using a process of extraction. Um, and uh, because of that, uh, and the demand of helium in increasing worldwide, um, it's, it's easy to see why the supply is being outstripped by the demand. So um, uh, if you go back three, four years, I think uh, those were the, uh, the big introductions of, of big price increases in helium, and, and it started to get attention uh, worldwide uh, but basically, the price of helium has increased by over 50% in the last three years and is expected to continue to rise. They're, they are looking at some new possible sources in some uh, big natural gas reserves in the Middle East, uh, but that's going to take um, uh, quite a bit of time to get those uh, facilities up and running. And um, Historically, once a high-value industrial gas price increases, um, it usually doesn't decrease, and uh, that, that, that can be proven historically. So what it really means from a helium supply and demand standpoint is it's going to be rationed. It already has started. Uh, helium is being rationed for critical applications. Uh, like MRI, which you can't use anything other uh, other than helium, and for a lot of military applications. So, really, what does that what does that mean? It, 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 I think uh, one of the articles, and there are many that cite the helium shortage and how it affects different industries. But I think this uh, this one reference that I have here sums it up. Um, we need to start thinking of ways to avoid the use of helium in what we're, um, in what we're using it for. So where, it, where an alternate gas can be used, it should be pursued. And that's the main message. And um, the price will continue to go up um, until there is, um, you know, until that message is, is received loud and clear. Um, it's not going away. So as you look at the helium shortage and how it affects your lab specifically, um, you have choices. Um, 
there are certainly methods and, and applications that you cannot use anything but helium, but those are few and far between uh, the main applications that helium is used for today. The main application is for as a carrier gas in GC, GCMS um, applications. Um, hydrogen is already being used as, as an FID fuel gas. And um, what really needs to be considered in, in broader terms in the uh, laboratory uh, space is using hydrogen as a carrier gas for gas chromatography. And um, where it is being considered against helium specifically, um, the return on investment, specifically looking at a gas generator, a hydrogen gas generator versus deliver helium, um, you're, you're, you're looking at a 12-week ROI on, on average. So as a lab manager, as a user of this, this gas, you have, you have decided you're going to helium. Well, I mean you're going to hydrogen. Well, you, you, uh, you now have choices to make as well. Do I get my hydrogen delivered? Do I get it delivered in cylinders? Do I get it delivered in larger bulk supplies to, to save on on those, um, on those delivery charges? Or do I look at an on-site gas generator? And one of those, uh, one of the main factors in your decision, especially since you're now dealing with a flammable gas, is safety. And um, I'm going to attempt uh, to highlight the safety aspects of generating your own hydrogen versus having it delivered. The main difference in the main safety aspect we're, we're talking about here is the volume of gas that you as a user and consumer of the gas is subjected to. So um, just imagine. Imagine you have a 12-pack, which is probably a reasonable assumption for a an average size lab, a 12-pack of cylinders of hydrogen. That 12-pack holds uh, roughly 3,600 standard cubic feet of hydrogen. Well, if you look at your lab space that is, is using that hydrogen, on average, I don't think there would be much debate to say that that space is roughly 10,000 cubic feet of space. I, I think that equates to roughly a 20 by 20 by 12 foot lab space. Um, so imagine now that, um, and, and this happens, leaks happen, right? Piping is, um, you, you do your best to, to contain the gas you're using, but worst case, you spring a leak. Now that gas that is stored in that 12-pack uh, of cylinders is now entering your space. You may have detectors, you may not, um, but as quickly as that gas can empty those cylinders, it's entering that space, and within a matter of seconds, that space now can be overcome. 30% 30, 30 of it is now, 30% of the air in that space is now displaced by hydrogen gas. So you immediately create an environment that, um, that has, uh, you know, 30% hydrogen in air mixture, which is highly volatile and, and certainly a, a, a a major hazard that will re result in, in something occurring in your lab. Um, <clears throat> the lower explosion, explosive limit of, of hydrogen is 4%. Uh, 
So anything above 4% uh, can and most likely will ignite. If you look at it as a compare, uh, uh, an on-site gas generator as a comparison, an on-site gas generator, even generating at its maximum production rate of hydrogen, um, has less than one liter of hydrogen in it at any time, meaning that you've just dramatically reduced the volume of gas that's stored on your facility. That's number one. Also, because a gas generator has a limited capacity to generate that gas, it can only feed a leak at worst case conditions um, at its maximum production rate. So even a what we call a lab, central lab server operating at 18.8 liters per minute, that's your leak rate. And at that rate, in that same space that, uh, that I uh, referred to, you're talking about less than 4% of, of hydrogen mixed with air, which means that, not that you would do this, but means that you can support that leak rate in your laboratory indefinitely without creating a hazard. Hard to, hard to understand that concept, but the math hold, holds up. So again, um, you know, on-site hydrogen generation eliminates, completely eliminates the safety concerns with switching from helium to hydrogen because it generates hydrogen on demand. It is only going to generate hydrogen, the hydrogen you need. And as that demand increases, so does the production rate. So it matches your demand from one cc a minute to whatever your, your demand is, instantaneously without creating a hazard. So as we look at now how on-site hydrogen generation compares to delivered hydrogen or helium, we can look at two options, point of use generation or what's considered a central lab server implementation of on-site gas generation. If you look at point of use, and again, you may choose point of use generation because you only have one or two uh, GCs in your lab. You may choose point of use generation because um, the infrastructure required to go from a central supply to your many GCs um, is cost prohibitive. But if we look at uh, point of use, a, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking broadly at what's available in the marketplace today from point of use generators, but a point of use generator can produce up to three cylinders a month of hydrogen for your lab. So that gives you an idea of, uh, you, you've got to have an idea of how many cylinders you're, you're replacing on a monthly basis. Uh, this gives you an idea of, of where you are. So you may need multiple units or uh, one unit, depending on your usage. If you look at um, the central lab server application and a centralized um, uh, generator, now this, in most facilities today that are using packs of cylinders or certainly high-pressure tube banks, um, to supply their helium or hydrogen. The infrastructure already exists. So this is a great solution because the, you, you have no infrastructure um, investment to make. You're just looking at putting a central lab server in the same place that that 12 pack of cylinders is located today. And with that 
on-site gas generation solution, you're, you're basically going to generate enough hydrogen uh, that's going to replace up to four cylinders a day. So, um, you know, whether that's a, if you're going through a six pack of cylinders a week, or really four cylinders a day, there are solutions out there that can provide you with on-site, on-demand hydrogen production. So again, as we, as we focus a little bit now on the larger applications of GC, these are laboratories that may have 10 instruments, 20, 30, 40. Um, I've seen installations for a central lab server that are feeding 60 GC instruments, uh, feeding them for both carrier gas and FID from one central facility using one central gas generator. Uh, the typical uh, application for that or, or implementation of that is to put it in a central location, have the piping to support all of the instruments to one central supply, and to have a, uh, a backup supply tied into the same line using a crossover manifold system that would automatically kick in if, for whatever reason, the gas generator were offline uh, for either maintenance or tripped offline by a power outage or, or whatever, uh, you would have a limited high pressure cylinder storage supply that would, you know, so you wouldn't have to interrupt your, your testing. Um, I've seen one cylinder used for that. I've seen multiple cylinders used for that. Again, depends on your usage and your comfort. So, um, so as it relates to helium, as it relates to hydrogen, there are many options. And every one of those options um, needs careful consideration. And the only real way to, uh, to determine what option is best for you is to involve a manufacturer of on-site gas generation systems, and uh, um, certainly, um, you know, uh, uh, I'm sure uh, a solution can be tailored specific to your needs. Um, I don't want to leave this presentation just to helium and hydrogen, even though that is a hot topic in the industry today. Uh, I want to talk about nitrogen as well. Nitrogen is, uh, there is, more nitrogen used in, in laboratory applications than helium and hydrogen combined um, by volume. Um, it's primarily used for LC, LCMS, um, uh, turbo VAP applications. Uh, there's a variety of applications that use nitrogen, varying usage rates and varying purity levels needed for those applications. But the traditional modes of supply remain relatively constant. Again, a lot of it depends on usage rate. There are labs being served by individual cylinders. You may have an individual cylinder tied to every bench that has an LCMS. You might have packaged cylinders that are in a gas cabinet or gas room supplying a bunch of instruments. If your usage rates are high enough, you're going you're gonna to move to liquid nitrogen doers um, that can supply uh, many instruments or cut your delivery uh, times uh, significantly, or tube trailers. Again, usage rate, your frequency of delivery, all affected by those modes of, of supply. Um, I want to point this out because it's, it's something that a lot of people, when I, when I talk uh, to them about the hazards of nitrogen, really don't come to mind. Uh, and I think it's because we're breathing air right now as we speak that has 78% nitrogen in it. 
it's considered an inert gas, non-hazardous gas, but it has a significant hazard, especially where you're using nitrogen of significant volume. Uh, there's a there's a big asphyxiation hazard associated with with nitrogen. Uh, there have been um, hundreds of reported deaths of asphyxiation by nitrogen um, uh, re recorded by the U.S. Chemical Safety and Hazard uh, Investigation Board, and uh, it's a it's a true hazard. Um, if you're not if you're using significant amounts of delivered nitrogen in your laboratory, especially in small confined space laboratories, and you don't have an oxygen analyzer that's tied to an alarm, it's highly recommended because of this asphyxiation hazard. So the same enemy you have with hydrogen, you have with nitrogen. The enemy for a safe operating environment is volume, and it really becomes a math, a, a quick math problem to, to, to really highlight what the hazard is for your specific uh, um, in, implementation. If you, if you think about the nitrogen, liquid nitrogen doer, and I know that a lot of laboratories today are moving to this, what is considered a micro bulk um, solution um, because of cost and because of those frequent deliveries and hazard and hassles of dealing with in individual cylinders. But what you need to consider is when you go to this solution, you are taking on more risk. If you think about the average, I'll call it laboratory size liquid nitrogen doer, you're talking about an average uh, stored volume of uh, roughly 5,000 cubic feet of nitrogen. And if you're looking at what I would consider an average size laboratory of about 10,000 uh, cubic feet of space, um, it's a significant hazard. You immediately, on a, on a leak, on a ruptured pipe that goes undetected, immediately fill that space. Um, you, you displace half of your breathing air with an asphyxiant. And it's something that you know, you need to consider. Um, like I said, there are ways around it. There are ways to protect yourself from these hazards, but it's something that, that every lab manager and every uh, user of high volume sources of nitrogen need to be aware of. So how does nitrogen gas generation help mitigate that risk? It does better than mitigate the risk. It actually solves the problem. If you consider that the average nitrogen gas generator used for LCMS applications is at a maximum producing five cubic feet a minute of pure nitrogen, even worst case of a pipe disconnected, pipe pipe broken, and all of that production of nitrogen going into that same space, it's a fraction of the air that's, uh, that's already in that space. And the displacement wouldn't even be noticed by a, an oxygen analyzer. Um, again, you need to consider that your compliant <laughs> to OSHA standards for just room air exchanges and, and proper ventilation for, a, uh, for the environment you're operating in. But even in an office environment uh, that is compliant to OSHA ventilation standards, we're talking about a very small fraction of displacement. So elimination of the risk. 
So as we compare, to give you, got, to give you an idea of how on-site gas generation compares to delivered, just on a volume basis, you know, you're, you probably already have a good idea of how many cylinders are flowing through your facility or how many doers you're managing through your facility. This gives you an idea of how a typical uh, nitrogen gas generator would, would help. Uh, you're going to eliminate uh, up to seven cylinders a day with the typical gas generator available today. You're going to eliminate up to two doers a week. Uh, so the ability to produce nitrogen on demand, on site, and eliminate uh, the hazards as well as the hassles of managing um, on site uh, uh, I mean, gas delivery um, is worth consideration. So um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, gas on-site gas generator advancements. So really, the the four main areas. That, uh, that I feel have been affected most um, by advancements. And this really affects uh, the adoption of on-site gas generation in the industry is, number one, higher reliability. You know, if you look at a cylinder, pack of cylinders, a doer, that's pretty reliable. Not much that can go wrong other than you run out, your truck doesn't show up for a delivery, or, or other things that may disrupt the supply. It's a pretty reliable source of, of gas for your lab. So the, the on-site gas generation um, option has got to have significant reliability in order to, to compete. And I would say 10, 15 years ago, there were reliability problems. Um, major advancements have been made by, by most of the manufacturers in the market today to, um, to, a, to address the reliability of on-site gas generation. And I would say probably the, the most advanced advancements have been made on the, the components of the nitrogen generator that uh, um, have the most cycles and have the most wear, and that's the small compressors. So uh, there have been uh, a lot of advancements in compressor technology. Uh, the, the more advanced um, suppliers of equipment are adopting those technologies and providing their customers with much higher reliabilities than it, that have been seen in, um, in, in the past. You have manufacturers that are entering this space uh, that have uh, the ability to produce products of better quality. Manufacturers that have ISO 9001 certifications, comply to international safety standards, supply equipment to other very high, uh, reliable, uh, very high reliable industries like the military, or um, uh, processes that cannot get interrupted without uh, major impacts on, um, on, on the facilities like power plants or semiconductor fabs. Those manufacturers are now entering this laboratory space because um, it's an attractive market for on-site gas generation. Larger capacities, especially for hydrogen gas generators, have been introduced to, to really address the broader helium to hydrogen crisis, or the helium crisis. 
and drive the helium to hydrogen conversion. Um, you'll see that uh, suppliers that, again, that have that manufacturability and better quality and higher reliability are also producing larger capacity generators to meet those broader applications. And as it relates to hydrogen, um, the elimination of hazardous chemicals to produce hydrogen are uh, quickly being um, uh, eliminated by most manufacturers. And PEM technology, which uses a solid polymer electrolyte versus a liquid electrolyte, is really the, the, the prime, primary choice for um, uh, advanced applications that, that um, want uh, reduced risk of, of uh, problems with hazardous chemicals, reduce the storage of hazardous chemicals on site, and uh, produce a high, uh, high value of gas for, uh, for the laboratory. Um, so with that, um, I just want to close with a, um, just a sneak peek on uh, Proton Onsite's analytical, analytical laboratory gas generator product line. Um, we do have a full suite of products that produce um, all of the gases needed to support all of the analytical laboratory applications. We have stackable nitrogen and hydrogen units uh, that limit the amount of space needed to, uh, to sort, uh, supply your gas. We have wall-mountable nitrogen units that are uh, silent. So where noise is an issue, uh, you can wall mount a nitrogen generator in your space and uh, run that off a, an air compressor that is in an equipment corridor or equipment uh, closet. Um, we have nitrogen products that uh, have integrated compressors. So if you're looking for a real easy to install, easy to operate, plug and play solution, uh, we have those. Uh, we, on the hydrogen side, we, like I've spoken about, we have point of use generators, which uh, produce hydrogen up to 600 cc's a minute, as well as central lab server hydrogen gas generators that produce hydrogen up to 18.8 .8 liters per minute, and enough to support um, uh, really any size laboratory. Uh, uh, any size laboratory's needs for GC, uh, carrier gas, or FID. So in closing, uh, I just want to pose two questions to you before you pose them to me. Um, are, you, are you thinking about switching from cylinders to gas generators? And um, do you need help in, in converting from helium to hydrogen? I think um, we get those questions all the time, and we provide answers to those questions on a daily basis. We have a staff here of applications engineers that work directly with our end users to tailor a solution that is specific to their needs and will support them for, um, for their applications uh, for, for a long time. So please uh, visit our website at uh, www.protononsite.com or contact us in person at 203-949-8697, uh, and we'd be happy to help you. With that, I will, uh, I will go back to Trevor and open it up for uh, questions and answers. Well, thanks very much, John, and uh, thank you to our uh, listeners for sending in your questions. Uh, I encourage you to continue to do so during our uh, question and answer session. Uh, John, we've got a, a number of questions from our audience. Um, the first one uh, uh, says that 
that uh, our listener is in the, the process of setting up a bulk tank of liquid nitrogen, a uh, 6,000-liter tank to provide high and low-pressure nitrogen for their facility. Uh, what, what's the return on investment of a nitrogen generator compared to bulk tank? Yeah, well, well certainly um, there, are, there are a number of factors. And uh, again, um, it's and I apologize, it's not a quick, short answer. Uh, we really need to understand your usage rates and um, and really compare the size generator that's best for your facility. You, you talk about a bulk system that's uh, going to hold 6,000 6, liters of liquid nitrogen, it sounds like a, a, a large nitrogen generator application. And um, um, I, I guess I, would, I can provide some typical numbers. Um, I think you would, uh, you would certainly see ROIs that are in the three or four year range for that, that size of installation. Um, and again, I think for smaller applications, the return on investment is, um, is much shorter. Great, thank you. Um, another uh, listener says they have oxygen cylinders that supply their sulfur analyzer and will be supplying their upcoming CHNS analyzer. Uh, are there any oxygen generators on the market? And is the purity uh comparable? Yeah, there are, and uh, you know, I chose not to not to discuss uh, oxygen specifically uh, uh, because um, you know, as far as the analytical lab market goes, uh, it is a smaller uh, section of the the market, um, and um, you know, I, I I didn't I didn't discuss it specifically, but there are a number of oxygen generator uh, solutions out there. Um, and again, it depends on your usage rate and your purity primarily when you're dealing with oxygen. Um, certainly, if, uh, if I get your contact information, I could point you in, in the direction of uh, some of those supply sources. Absolutely. We'll be sure to uh, provide that. Uh, is the purity comparable to UHP uh, grade cylinders? Um, for which gas? For oxygen. For oxygen. Um, yes, I think there are, um, again, fewer oxygen uh, devices available that can generate oxygen at UHP grade, but there are. There are some that uh, can, can hit that mark. Great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Concerning your uh, your central hydrogen uh, lab server that you spoke about, how many GCs can be supported by that uh, that system? Um, it uh, it certainly it, de it depends a little bit. Um, the central lab server that um, uh, that we highlighted in the presentation it really comes in uh, uh, three main uh, capacities. Uh, 4.8 liters per minute, uh, 9.6 liters per minute, 18.8 liters per minute. So it has a broad uh, range of uh, capability. Um, if you're, and I would say for the typical GC that is looking at both carrier and FID, uh, you're looking at a consumption rate that uh, is roughly 100 to maybe 150 cc's a minute. So you're talking about, uh, even at our smallest capacity, 40 units, um, maybe 35 if you, if you want to have some headroom. Um, again, um, we look at each application uh, uh, very specifically and uh, provide a solution that's tailored for the uh, specific application. Great, thank you. Um, if you're using a, a central server, are there any concerns with pressure drops or, or piping impurities if this is going long distances? 
Uh, well, the benefit we have, especially with a central supply for hydrogen, is that you're dealing with the lightest element in the universe. Uh, so um, quite a bit different than nitrogen. Uh, but let's let's stay on hydrogen for a moment. If if you're dealing with hydrogen um, at the flow rates that that we're discussing, even at maximum consumptions, let's say for a hundred GC instruments um, in one location, um, we're talking about a line size of about quarter inch maximum to support that flow rate without any appreciable pressure drop, um, and we're talking, you know, uh, distances of over a thousand meters. Great, thank you. Um, now, as far as maintenance and uh, and servicing, um, how how frequently should these uh, these generators be serviced, and can lab staff be trained to to perform routine maintenance? Yeah, uh, good question. Um, most on-site gas generators, and I'll lump them uh, into two categories, hydrogen and nitrogen, um, require very little maintenance. Um, on the hydrogen side, point of use, there are a number of manufacturers that provide maintenance-free gas generators, which uh, really only require uh, the replacement of, of a resin, a water uh, purification resin bag, uh, which I wouldn't consider much maintenance at all. It's 15 minutes every 90 days. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then on the centralized hydrogen supply, you're talking about, on average, about eight hours per year of maintenance, mostly filter changes. When you're talking about nitrogen, uh, because of the different varieties, uh, different options you have for, for nitrogen, if you're talking about a membrane system that does not have a compressor, uh, you're really talking about very limited maintenance. Uh, you're talking about a couple filters changed uh, semi-annually, so a couple hours. If you're talking about a nitrogen system that has a compressor in it um, and or uses a PSA system, you're going to have a little bit more maintenance involved uh, associated with uh, compressor parts that need to be changed out periodically um, and, um, and filter changes for, for the PSA. Um, in all cases, um, the gas generators are mostly supported by or, or maintained by the end user or the end user's facility um, groups. Great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> concerning the uh, the purity of uh, the hydrogen gas uh, generators, how uh, how pure is this, and uh, and can it support carrier gas applications without any further purification? Yeah. Um, well, there are there are generally two types of gas generators on the market today. Uh, one type of gas generator is designed and sold primarily to to uh, to be used for the FID market, and those um, those generators typically have uh, five nines pure hydrogen as the output without uh, any further purification downstream before the instrument. The other uh, gas generators that are available are uh, specifically designed to support the carrier gas application, which in uh, some applications, and not all, require six nines pure hydrogen as a minimum, and then a few applications even require seven nines. Um, but uh, there are gas generators on the market that can meet those requirements without further purification downstream. Great, thank you. Um, 
Our next question asks, uh, how does uh, NFPA 45 impact the use of hydrogen generators? Well, uh, NFPA 45 um, um, Well, certainly, let me back up. The, the point of use gas generators fall, certainly fall under um, any limitations on um, uh, volume of gas generated as well as volume of gas stored. So they, they are not uh, uh, relevant to uh, NFPA 45. Um, as it relates to the lab server as well, um, in, in most cases, that lab server generator can be placed uh, in a non-classified space, as the point of use generator can, because of the low volume of stored gas. Again, I'll, I'll cite uh, what I had in the presentation, less than one liter of hydrogen on board, as well as um, um, the, uh, the limited production rate. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I think that brings us to the end of our webinar today. Uh, I want to thank you for, uh, uh, for your presentation today. Uh, if you have any further questions, uh, please consider reaching out to John directly. His contact information, as you can see, is available on the screen now. And just a reminder that today's webinar video will be available at the link you see on the screen. Uh, on behalf of Lab Manager, I'd like to thank John for his excellent presentation. I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Proton Onsite, for supporting our Tech Trends webinar series. As well, I would like to thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today. Please mark your calendar for our next Tech Trends webinar, which will focus on analytical chemistry techniques. This webinar will be taking place Thursday, April 24th from noon until 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. For more information, please visit our website at www.labmanager.com. We hope you can join us again next time. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of your day.